Welcome to this edition of Advanced Reaction Engineering. We will look at what we will do in this course over the period of the next 30, 40 lectures or so. So, quickly try to tell you what we plan to do for you. In the last edition of course overview, uh, we looked at some of the features that we might do. So, we go on with that. So, we look at energy balance and we mentioned uh, in the last edition that energy balance we look at two issues one is stirred tanks and uh, tubular vessels. Now, uh, we also mentioned that uh, stirred tanks are quite popular particularly in, uh, in small scale processing uh, while tubular vessels are uh, generally very large scale processing. Now, whether it is small or large, we need to be able to conduct the chemical reactions of our interest and therefore, adding and removing of heat and controlling the temperature at which we will conduct the reaction is crucial to success of the operations that you and I will do. So, we have to write the energy balance and understand how uh, the you know energy I mean heat is generated uh, in the reaction and so on. Therefore, the balances that we write take into account all these features which we will do. Okay. Now, a, a related uh, issue that uh, all of us uh, uh, recognize is that when you are running a process, clearly there is something called start up, there is something called shut down, there is something called safety and sudden issues as a result of which you may have to shut down processes and all or transient, transient operations, operations become crucial. Okay. Now, Transient operations uh, are issues in which we have to understand how the process uh, uh, deals with uh, various kinds of disturbances that might happen in the process. In other words, uh, when there is a disturbance to a process, we must know whether that disturbance will, uh, will cause irreversible damage to the process or the disturbance is such that you know the process is able to adjust itself and return to its original state. In other words, uh, we need to understand what is called a stability, stability of we call steady states. Okay. So, we will look at uh, some of these issues as we go along. In other words, what we are trying to say is that I mean, what is most important to us is that our process should run, should be safe number one. Two, that if there is a disturbance, it must return to the original state in reasonable period of time okay. and therefore, the design must take into account whether this is able to do that or in other words, I mean what is it that we must do in design so that it happens the way we want it to happen. Okay. So, this is uh, what uh, we mean by steady I mean stability and we will look at some of these issues uh, as we go along. Now, a related perhaps uh, no less important is you know we must look at you know we must know how to apply the equation that we have derived for various situations and therefore, we look at practice problems great variety of practice problems okay. we, wherein uh, we uh, formulate our problems in such a way that uh, we are able to uh, come as close to reality as possible or in other words we look at situations which are as close to reality that we might encounter. Okay. Or not. So, what we are saying is that all practice problem that we will do in this uh, in this course uh, will be something that uh, we might be able to make use of in daily life. Okay, that's the kind of uh, selection that we have done. Okay, now there are few things that uh, we must uh, draw our attention. Let's say we have a, a chemical reactor. Okay, let's say we have this chemical reactor is is uh, heated. This is uh, cooling or heating. Let us say cooling. Typically, it is cooling or it can be heating as well. This is the reactor. Okay. Now, frequently our intention, our I mean our interest is to be able to operate this at constant temperature, constant T. Okay. Now, if this is an exothermic, say its reaction goes A, A goes to B, let us say it is exothermic. Okay. Therefore, uh, heat of reaction heat is evolved. Okay. 
but and there might be a catalyst ok. Let us say this is got a catalyst in, inside here is a catalyst ok, uh, which uh, might undergo uh, some deleterious uh, processes may take place as, as a result of which catalyst may, may lose its activity and so on. So, our interest would be to uh, operate this at a temperature which is most suitable for this catalyst let us say some, some temperature which is most suitable for this catalyst. Now, the question that is of interest to us is that is it really possible for a reactor to be operated at a constant temperature while we have to deal with a reaction which is exothermic, a reaction which is called a catalyst, a reaction in which a catalyst is undergoing uh, some kind of deactivation or poisoning whatever because of the reaction. Now, the, the answer to this is that yes it is possible there is a design that you and I must do so that this becomes possible or in other words we must have a design we must have a design if this is the distance along the reactor okay and if this is temperature we want this to be just uh, the same irrespective of what happens in the reactor and that is the design in fact as we go around go along we will set up our equations and then ask this question to, to, uh, to all of us and what is it that we must do to see that the temperature does not change. Okay. In other words in formulated in the in the language of uh, chemical reaction engineering what is it that we must do if this is volume which changes or distance or volume what is it that we must do this does not change along the length of the equipment. Okay. So, these are very interesting situations and we will uh, we will look at them and we will uh, formulate equations and then come to a stage where we can tell exactly how we can achieve constancy which otherwise seem not very easy in inside such kind of tubular vessels. So, these are all what we call as practice practice problems in the sense where we learn to use the equations that we have derived to be able to describe our requirements or to achieve the requirements of our process. Now, there are there could be situations let us say for example, there could be situations I mean we all, all of us know that see we, we, we burn coal coal combustion ok. We burn coal combustion to generate steam and then this is you know then drives a turbine and then it gives us it gives us uh, electricity this is something that we all know ok. Ok. In other words what we generally do in the industry is that we burn coal in a boiler and then there is there is water high pressure water going through the pipes or tubes in the boiler. So, in other words it is an indirect contact contact is not direct but indirect ok. In other words the energy or heat of combustion heat of combustion combustion is is directed into steam that is how we derive energy. Now, we will as we go along we will consider situations we will consider situations where we have a chemical reaction let us say A goes to B okay, and then B goes there is a chemical reaction. Can we conduct this chemical reaction in for example, in, uh, in a turbine so that we derive energy or power directly out of chemical reaction or in other words can we you know we are used to conducting chemical reactions in a boiler and making steam and then using that steam in the generator and so on. But we can also look at situations where we can actually conduct the reactions in this turbine itself so that we derive energy directly. I mean, is this possible? If so, what does it mean? What are the numbers that would be appropriate? What are the systems that we might look at and things like that? In other words, chemical reaction chemical reaction as working fluid working fluid in a turbine you know as an example can we do this we would like to I know we like to pose this question and see whether there are situations where we can look at which might give us this kind of uh, uh, flexibility in deriving energy from a chemical reaction in the form of electricity and so on. Okay. So, I mean what I am trying to put across to you is that these practice problems, these practice problems are problems that, that try to present a way of looking at the equations that we derive uh, in a form that we can use them in daily life for our applications. For example, in a, this is common in process industry that let us say there are reactions 
a goes to b and then but a also goes to c and this might be a desired product okay and this might be an undesired product correct so in other words our concern our interest in design is to see that you know we we maximize the desired product and minimize the undesired product so, there, are, there would be design or uh, criteria that we can derive based on the equations of material energy balance that will tell you how to, uh, how to find the conditions of optimality. So, that we can drive your process in the direction of our interest. So, we will look at such practice problems as well. Now, there are situations for example, where a reaction is very, very rapid instantaneous. Okay. So, when a reaction is instantaneous or in other words the rate processes are so large uh, that, uh, that we cannot uh, write equations in which are very large quantities. So, there will be methods that we must derive from our basic principles that will deal with instantaneous reactions where heat energy is involved in a heat uh, I mean uh, energy exchanges are involved. So, we will look at such practice problems as well practice problems wherein we have to deal with very very fast reactions very very fast reactions having said this having said this uh, that whatever whatever uh, equations that we have uh, written for a long time is uh, what we call as ideal reactors by ideal reactors what we mean is that we we postulate that our reaction equipment, our reaction equipment has a certain this is what is called as a stirred tank, continuous stirred tank reactor, and this is the plug flow reactor, what we call plug flow reactor. Okay. So, what what is implied here is that the the time of residence, the time of residence, time of residence of these fluid elements, okay, if, if all the fluid elements spend the same length of time. Okay. This is one type of device, this, this is an ideal reactor okay. and here is another instance where the all the residence time here is an exponentially you know in the sense that as soon as material enters here it mixes this is what is called the well mixed or the well stirred tank reactor. Okay. Now, in, in reality there uh, you might not have a situation which is completely mixed or a um, reality in which this the residence time for every element is the same. In other words, in, in actuality there could be lots of uh, differences between I mean, very different from these two ideal situations. Therefore, our, our interest of course, is uh, to be able to understand reality okay, number one, number two to be able to change that reality to the in the direction of our interest. So, first of course, we should understand reality. So, in order to understand such reality we, we will look at what is called as residence time distribution. distribution. So, the object of this of this kind of study is that if you have an equipment into which your fluids come and fluids go. So, what we would like to know a fluid element that enters now how long does it stay here before it exits. So, fluid element that enters now at t equal to 0 how long does it stay here before it exits. Now, this information itself is useful because after all we all know that the extent to which a reaction occurs is, is uh, dependent on the time that it spends in the reaction environment correct. So, what is called as residence time in the reaction equipment is something crucial to our understanding of what will happen to that reaction or our understanding of how to drive that reaction to the in the direction of our interest. Okay. So, this is an important study which is able to give us insights into non idealities, non idealities. Okay. So, this is the way we try to quantify non idealities that is by putting a tracer and trying to see how long it stays inside the equipment okay. and this whole study is called as residence time distributions. Okay. So, we will look at uh, uh, the fundamentals of residence time distributions and we will look at how to conduct experiments to get information on residence time distributions 
we will look at how uh, what types of tracers that we can use so that we can measure them accurately okay whether it is a liquid whether it is a gas whether it is a solid whether it is a mixture whatever for different situations there are different methods that we can use different techniques that we can use to measure and so on we will look at all that uh, in, as we go along having said this now that we understand the fundamentals of trying to do a measurement of the residence time distribution of course we look at practice problems the whole object of of taking this approach is that every time we develop a method we would like to see how that method applies in real life how that method can be used to derive insights into what happens in a process okay this process can be in the chemical industry or in our daily life that you and i experience in whatever we experience in daily life so we would like to see that how closely can we use methods to understand what goes on around us okay that's the idea of residence time let me just give you a small example residence time let's say if i suppose there is a crowded crowded uh, railway station and um, a lot of people are moving uh, moving along the railway station now let us say from here to here there is um, distance d now how long does it take from going from here to here if i ask okay now on a day when there is no crowd if it might take say 2 minutes on a day when there is a lot of crowd it might take 10 minutes or in other words the same device if if you call this as a device the same device uh, the residence time can be small or it can be large now the fact that you know residence time uh, change because of the of the uh, load this is the load because of the load so we must be able to understand how the load affects residence time you see that is why we have to do such measurements because we want to we will be loading our equipment and therefore we want to know how that load affects the residence time because that residence time will determine the extent to which our reaction occurs okay so this these kinds of practice problems are crucial to getting insights into how we are able to derive information about non idealities in a process so that we can account for it in our design and in our operation so that we avoid failures troubleshooting safeties and all those issues arises from uncertainties in the process that we are dealing with see what seems to be important is that let's say we have a, a gas solid react let's say you have iron oxide let's say it's reacting with car carbon monoxide giving you carbon dioxide and iron okay now this reaction this reaction uh, you can conduct let's say in a blast furnace all over the world okay or it can be conducted in you know in a smaller scale it's what is called a sponge iron technology okay now what i'm trying to put across to you is that if there is if there is a a device let's say it's a rotary kiln it's a rotary kiln where you have let us say iron oxide is coming in and then you put your carbon monoxide so that the reaction like as just as an example it is not the way it happens in the industry Inst if it is sponge if it is sponge iron they put hydrogen here if it is blast furnace the whole device looks different but that's not the point i'm trying to get across to you the point i'm trying to put across to you is that the solids that enter the process the solids that enter the process they may travel like this and get out depending upon the Uh, the if it is a rotary kiln we are rotating it you see now we know that it is important that we know what is the time it spends in the equipment okay because that depends the extent of reaction so if you'll find that this whole rtd analysis rtd analysis becomes very very valuable when you are dealing with solids because you know solids have a residence time and therefore they have uh, the extent to which the reaction will occur will depend on, depend upon how long it spends in the reaction equipment you see so this is something that uh, uh, we know from our uh, understanding that uh, residence times are crucial of course it's crucial for all processes but in the case of solids we need special i mean devices to be able to handle solids so that the gas solid reaction can occur now what's what's crucial let me just put this down once again now what we all know is that every reaction is governed by a certain equilibrium constant in this case 
it is this. Okay. So, the reaction stops when it reaches equilibrium and the value of the equilibrium constant is determined by what is called from thermodynamics we know this that uh, it is dependent on the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and carbon, carbon monoxide. What is important is to recognize that since the reaction stops when the, the value of uh, P C O 2 by P U becomes K P, it also means that as the products accumulate, as the products accumulate the reaction starts to slow down because you know the driving force for the reaction has come down correct. So, what is uh, I mean uh, as you go along we will set up methods and then uh, derive equations which will tell us how the uh, equilibria or thermodynamics affects the rate uh, I mean the rate at which the reaction occurs okay. that is something which is important to us and then we use thermodynamic principles to set up equations which will tell us how the thermodynamics affects the rate of chemical reaction. Okay, we will look at that as well some of these features. Now, when you are looking at solids let us once again let us look at F E 2 O 3 giving plus C O giving you F E plus C O 2. Now, whenever we have a reaction in which solids are uh, uh, have to be uh, managed then we know that if the reaction equipment if this let us say if this reaction equipment okay, into which we are putting solids okay, and then let us say the solids come out. Okay. Therefore, solids going in solids coming out. So, we need techniques to look at the particle which goes through the equipment and probably exits through the exit pipe. In other words, we need to be able to set up what is called as population balance. Why is it important? Why is it population balance important? Because as a technique, as a technique, this uh, population balance is able to uh, write balances on the number of particles. Okay, they are able to deal with number density. Okay, so it becomes very useful when you are dealing with populations to deal with number densities, number densities then we can translate it to any other form depending upon what is required. But population balance is one technique by which we can deal with those kind of populations. Okay. Now, so a question that is of interest to us is that this material let us say iron oxide they may come with different particle sizes. Okay. The particle sizes may be distributed between two ranges. So, as this particle size of different particle size enters the equipment of course, they will react in forms which are uh, which is uh, dependent on particle size. Okay. So, therefore, the inlet particles with different particle sizes will react differently and therefore, emerge differently. So, all those effects we have to account for population balance is a very nice technique which is available in the literature. Now, population balance uh, we have said is useful for uh, uh, understanding and uh, modeling uh, particulate systems, but it is a technique which is uh, which got much wider uh, uses and we can look at uh, what happens in a forest and we can understand how the birth and death functions affect the population of the forest and so on and we will look at some of these uh, issues as exercises as a part of this course. Now, uh, I mean uh, environment is something that uh, we all are uh, you know understanding trying to understand various issues. Now, if you look at our environment I mean what is it we have the atmosphere, we have the uh, biosphere of land, they have soil and we have rock and uh, you have water and there is carbon which is circulating between uh, the pools as carbon dioxide and there are other gases uh, you know circulating like nitrogen uh, in the form of uh, protein etcetera. So, all these fluxes are essentially uh, the cause uh, I mean caused by various chemical reactions uh, by geochemical and biochemical and so on and uh, modeling these biochemical reactions will help us understand how the, the, the ecosystem is performing and how we can uh, regulate our lives to see that you know the atmosphere and the biosphere etcetera are in good shape and good health etcetera. So, these are some issues which we will look at. Uh, and uh, through certain exercises which will give us some insights into how we can understand 
to what is happening around us. Now, having said this, having said this, I mean all of us know that ecology is what uh, ensures that our environment is in excellent shape and in ecology what happens is that there are many organisms, one organism living on the other and so on. Therefore, this food chain uh, ensures that the, the, the accumulation of pollution in the environment is very small or very, very uh, so small that it does not affect the population's performance etcetera. Now, we would like to design systems in which in we are able to integrate the ecology in such a way that uh, you know our systems are able to make good use of the ecological uh, uh, benefits and we will look at some problems uh, of this nature as we go along. Having said this, I mean so one issue of great concern I mean great interest to all of us is uh, what happens to our rivers. And we know that uh, our rivers are not in very good shape because of uh, the great amount of pollution load that comes into the rivers and uh, as a result we find that the oxygen levels in the rivers are depleting and uh, to that extent uh, the aquatic life uh, which depends upon this oxygen source also tends to uh, deplete and then lose its vitality and so on. So, of course, I mean we need rivers, but at the same time we also need to manage the, uh, the, the problems of uh, of populations and so on and uh, therefore, we have to understand how we can manage the pollution entering the rivers, so that the rivers health is kept in good shape and these are some of the issues we would like to look at when we look at uh, reaction engineering as applied to environmental engineering and so on. We look at some of these issues as we go along and we all know I mean uh, it is not new to us, we all know that life is governed by enzymes and therefore, we must understand fundamentals of enzyme kinetics and to that extent the fundamentals of microbial kinetics after all microbial uh, processes are also governed by enzymes in its fundamental way. Therefore, we want to look at um, enzymes, microbes and microbial reactions all of which that affect our environment and so on. So, we look at some of these issues as we go along. Now, uh, we know in our industry that we make alcohol, we make uh, antibiotics, uh, we make various enzymes. and. Uh, I mean, alcohol is a pure culture process using saccharomyces. Many antibiotics are produced, penicillin as an example, uses penicillin, chrysogenum, and so on. So, we also would like to use our principles of reaction engineering to understand how these processes can be understood, how they can be designed, how they can be operated, and so on. So, some basic issues of reaction engineering is applied to these processes. We will look at as exercises as you go along. Now, from the standpoint of uh, of trying to understand environment and polyculture and so on. There are several uh, reactions that we all know that uh, which uses polyculture. For example, waste treatment, biomethanation and most importantly agriculture, animal husbandry, fisheries all of these are polyculture processes where uh, there are there is a food chain which is operating and that food chain is what we must be able to understand and design for and uh, we will look at some of these issues as exercises as you go along. So, to cut this uh, long story short, what is the contents of this uh, reaction engineering course is something like this. The first five lectures uh, uh, we look at a course overview in, in some detail, then we look at design equations and then we look at some illustrative examples concerned with design equations. And uh, we go to design equations too, where we look at wider issues concerned with uh, design equations. Now, in uh, in lecture 6 to 8, uh, what we have tried to do is that try to uh, spend some time on illustrating how these design equations can be used for a variety of purposes and several types of examples we have taken to illustrate how these equations apply. Under lecture 8, we are looking at multiple reactions. I mean, the important point is that I mean, uh, in, in real life, whether it is in industry or in, 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 in environment or biochemical processes and so on we look at uh, we deal with multiple reactions. So, some basics of multiple reactions is what we have tried to introduce in lecture number 8. Now, going on from 9 to 13 in, in lecture 9 uh, what we look at is uh, you know whether how to use our understanding of multiple reactions to understand reactions in soil, how these relate to various productions from soil and so on and then we go on to uh, in lecture 10. Uh, semi continuous operations particularly batch semi batch operations where time is a critical element in the operations and so on. And 11 12 
uh, and 13 we are looking at uh, catalyst deactivations I mean catalyst deactivation particularly in chemical process of industry catalyst is a crucial thing and then they are all time dependent processes. So, we have to understand some fundamentals and how these fundamentals can be used for design of deactivating catalyst processes that is what we try to do in lecture number 11, 12 and 13. What has been said in lectures 1 to 13 is assuming that we are uh, system is at isothermal conditions which is uh, may not be the case always there is an energy, energy balance which we must consider. So, in lecture 14 and 15 we set up the basics of energy balance and that is required to deal with uh, uh, stirred vessels and then plug flow vessels and so on and 16, 17 and 18 we are looking at the applications of these basics of energy balance coupled with material balance to understand certain applications of uh, energy balance in reacting systems. Okay. So, under 16, 17 and 18 we illustrate how our equations and energy balance can be put to use for various purposes including design. In lecture 19, 20 and 21 essentially we are sort of taking the energy balance to, to, to greater and greater detail trying to understand how the uh, temperature affects the rate in equilibria how we can understand stability of stirred tanks, how we can understand you know uh, illustrate this through various examples and so on. So, lecture 19 to 22 uh, are instances where we are trying to see various ramifications of energy balance for our applications. In lecture 23, 24 and 25, 23 and 24 we are still dealing with energy balance where of course, we look at uh, some new features uh, particularly uh, you know heated I mean tubular reactors heated and cooled and so on. So, uh, 23 and 24 are still further extensions or uh, further considerations of energy balance okay. and in 25 we do something interesting where we try to use some measurements of uh, operating data to see how we can design for situations uh, where we can use some data of the uh, process. 26 we try to introduce a new technique called residence time distribution of course, uh, we have talked about it already where we try to uh, understand how long uh, the fluid elements spend in the environment by using a tracer depending upon it is a gas or a liquid or a solid we choose appropriate tracers and so on. So, under lecture 26 we introduce the fundamentals of uh, residence time distributions and how they can be measured and so on. And, uh, in lecture 27 we look at models by which we can understand residence time distributions and so that in lecture 26 and 27 we introduce the basics. So, that uh, we are able we are in a position to uh, uh, to model real vessels and understand the performance of real vessels. Uh, using this basics of uh, residence time we go on to an important area of gas solid reactions in lecture 28. 29 and 30, where we try to uh, understand how gas solid reactions occur. We introduce the concept of shrinking core, uh, set up models to understand uh, shrinking cores under different controlling regimes and so on. And then we illustrate this through examples uh, under lecture 31. So, so that the idea of lecture 28, 29, 30 and 31 is to have a way by which we can understand uh, gas solid reactions under the uh, concepts of uh, shrinking core models. Now, gas solid reactions, gas solid reactions we are dealing with particulates. So, when a particulate material is moving through uh, an equipment, it uh, has certain uh, features of residence times and so on we pointed out. So, when we have such variations, such interesting features in our system population balance modeling becomes very useful. In population balance modeling what we try to do is that we try to understand how populations behave and set up equations so which is able to describe uh, the uh, performance of the populations etcetera. So, under uh, population balance model lecture 32 and 33 we introduce the basic concepts and 34 and 35 we try and illustrate how these concepts can be put to use for variety of applications. So, basically 32, 33 and 34 we try to introduce population balance through simple examples and then try and illustrate how this can be put to use, uh, this can be put to use for our applications. 
So in 35 we try to move on to a new area where we try to look at reactions in our environment whether it is uh, uh, for example in soil or in the atmosphere or in the biosphere some examples that keep this planet in good shape. I mean what we try to say here is that reactions of the environment whether it is photosynthesis, this respiration, there is uh, what is called as nitrogen fixation, then there is something called biomethanation, and there is something called nitrification, denitrification, a variety of chemical reactions, mineral weathering and so on which actually put this uh, I mean make this planet do what it is doing as far as uh, life processes are concerned. So what we try to do in uh, lecture number 35 is to is to sort of uh, overview what these reactions are and what are the basics and uh, of uh, chemical kinetics and uh, thermodynamics and how uh, we can understand and how we can put uh, our basic understanding of these reactions in our design of uh, systems that we uh, come that we require in daily life. So that is essentially uh, lecture 35 is to sensitize all of us to the applications of chemical reaction engineering in dealing with environment uh, with our environment. With this we go on further under um, lecture 36 where we look at specifics of uh, biochemical engineering and environmental engineering. For example, we try to uh, look at uh, what are basics of enzyme kinetics, basics of microbial kinetics and how uh, fundamentals of these uh, kinetic process can be put together in the form of design for our requirements in daily life. Having said this, having said this we look at uh, uh, we look at uh, some illustrative examples uh, where we take what we have learnt in our basics of uh, enzyme kinetics and microbial kinetics to understand important reactions like biomethanation, alcohol fermentation and natural selection, how natural selection happens in our environment. I mean some simple examples to illustrate how uh, we can understand why you know this great variety of nature things that we see in our natural environment, how we can understand them uh, by uh, formulating some simple mathematics to illustrate how things happen. So uh, lecture 37 is way of trying to uh, apply what we have learnt in the basics of microbial kinetics and uh, enzyme kinetics to what we see in daily life. Then we go on uh, in the lecture 38 uh, to look at some simpler things in, the, in, in enzyme reactions, in microbial reactions, in base treatment, so on, trying to sort of uh, gather, uh, gather more uh, uh, insights into the applications of the basics for understanding biological reactions. Now, having said this, having said this, uh, uh, one of the one of the prime uh, uh, problems, uh, particularly of uh, water uh, water systems in, in India, for example is that uh, this great amount of pollution that the rivers have to face because of uh, various kinds of population pressures. Therefore, we take some examples of oxygen sag analysis of rivers, how uh, the, uh, the oxygen demand of the rivers uh, in terms of its uh, natural processes as well as due to interference from uh, various pollution loads, how uh, they can be understood and how we can regulate the pollution entry into the rivers so that the river quality remains satisfactory and what kind of design uh, uh, interventions can be thought of and so on in the form of mathematical formulation under lecture 39. And in lecture 40 we try to illustrate this using various kinds of miscellaneous examples for example under oxygen sag analysis we take some examples similarly population balance modeling we take some examples or in other words in lecture 40 and 41 what we try to do is that uh, try to uh, you know look at miscellaneous problems uh, that we have looked at over the entire course and try and illustrate how what has been uh, learnt over the last number of lectures they can be applied to understand various kinds of situations in in 42 Essentially what we would like to do is uh, a set of problem sheets uh, which uh, compiles a large variety of problems uh, that can provide insights into the applications of the equations that we have derived. So that this is all summarized in the form of uh, problem sheets uh, in lecture 42. In other words what uh, we are trying to say here is the lecture 1 to lecture 42 is uh, 
is trying to sort of foray into uh, subject of chemical reaction engineering and uh, try to illustrate how we can use basic principles to understand how things happen around us and how we can intervene through design to make our environment in our designs of chemical process of industry and so on, uh, so that safety, security, productivity, economics, etc., can be achieved. Now, this whole material, this whole material that uh, we have uh, been talking about over the last uh, 42 lectures has been taken from various sources and I have just listed some of these sources. One is uh, H.S. Uh, Scott Fogler, uh, a fantastic book written, uh, I think it is 1986 was the first edition and, uh, and uh, that is 2000 also is there I think. Okay. Uh, a lot of the material that I have done in this is taken from Scott Fogler. And uh, there is also material taken from J. M. Smith, Chemical Engineering Kinetics, a McGraw Hill publication. Okay. And there is some material that has been taken from K. G. Denby's Chemical Reactor Theory, it is a Cambridge University Press publication. And also taken some material from Octave Levenspiel's Chemical Reaction Engineering, it is a Wiley publication of 1997. In the sense, these books have been published even earlier, even Fogler's book was first published in 1974. It has gone through several editions and uh, it is a great book which I have enjoyed. Similarly, James Smith's book, of course, uh, it has been there for a very long time. It is a fantastic book. It uh, has been revised and then edited a number of times. Similarly, K. G. Denby and Octave Levenspiel, all of them are great textbooks and uh, material that is done, taken in this uh, lecture series has been adapted from these sources. Having said this, there are a few things which we have uh, uh, not been able to cover, which I am hoping that we will include in course of time. That is diffusion and reaction in pores catalysts, where we look at diffusion coefficients in pores, effective factors in pores and temperature effects in catalysts and then catalyst design. It is a very important area. We have not been had the time to look at these issues, which we will do so in, in our in, in future and shortly. Similarly, there is a huge area of uh, gas liquid reactions, I mean of industry all of us know and the most important application of gas liquid reactions has been carbon dioxide removal in the fertilizer industry. It is developed uh, beautifully over the last 40, 50 years. We have not had uh, the time to look at gas solubilities in liquids, the effect of chemical reactions and various examples to illustrate how gas liquid reactions can be understood, can be can be modeled uh, and systems can be designed for our daily use. We have not been able to do this and uh, hope to include this material in course of time. So, with this uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.